Yeah, that's what I was afraid of, because I know the Thanksgiving is, um, yeah, that's what, two weeks from this Friday? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or, or wait a minute, three weeks from today, right? Whatever. Yeah, three weeks from today. Yeah, so we'll have to, um, we'll have to figure it out. Okay. Uh, right. So at the end of last time, we were getting close uh, to finally uh, being able to write down our two-point correlation function um, in general. And but we had stumbled upon the fact that at some point um, that uh, at some point we had dropped our T goes to infinity limit. Right? And I went back and looked, and sure enough, it is. We did introduce it because we wanted to be, uh, we wanted to isolate the uh, non the, the free field theory uh, ground state, the vacuum state. Right? So we, we introduced that limit to kill off all the higher order terms. And so we were able to replace our vacuum state and the interacting theory with our vacuum state and the non interacting theory. Okay? So last time we did, had to put it back in, we decided to put it back in uh, in the vertex correction, or in the vertex rule. Right? So in uh, position space, it would look something like this. right? And then in momentum space, um, no, I'm sorry. Uh, this is still, this is momentum space, right? Yeah, this is momentum space. And if we re reintroduce our, our limit, right, then this thing will go like this. Uh, with our, li our limit, taking our limit here, and I've split the integration. Uh, what the hell about that? There's <laughs> a record. I'm, I'm lost already on the first page. You uh, split the time component. Yeah, I know that, but I mean, um, this is the Feynman rule in Shit. momentum space? Yeah, it says momentum space. Okay. So this is right. momentum space. I'm so just wondering right. about where this factor comes from. Mm -hmm. I must have forgotten it over here. Because all I'm doing is putting it back in the limit. Okay, so let me put that back in here. So this is e to the minus i of p. Dot. Okay, where p here, I'm shortening it. Uh, remember that for a four point vertex, um, it's you take all the incoming the plus signs and outgoing with a minus sign. I think this was how we had set it up before. Okay, so I just replaced P uh, for all this junk here, so I don't have to keep writing it. Okay, and so um, what we want to do is investigate, because we're taking T to infinity, slightly skewed, uh, but we're still taking it to infinity, so we want to investigate the effect on this um, time interval, the zero component interval. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, okay. So let's look at that. All right, so... Uh, even I can um, do this integration, right? So when I integrate this thing, I get something that looks like this. And what I want to do is evaluate the, these two points. Right? And so I get something that looks like this. Right? Just plug me in the limits. And just allow me to put infinities here just for the time being so you can see um, what's going to happen. Yeah. Okay, and, th and then I'm going to distribute these terms uh, through this i minus i epsilon piece. Right? And what you see is that this guy breaks into uh, two well-behaved pieces, what I call well-behaved. So this is just an oscillating term. Right? And then you get this term that's going to die off exponentially. Okay? So that's well-behaved as you take the limit out to infinity. Oh, and this term you get, again, an oscillating term. But in this case, you get an exponential that grows. Okay? So as you take t to infinity, this thing is not well-behaved. Right? It's going to blow up. Okay, so that's where we're seeing that this integral, if we uh, plug in uh, our limits here and take t 
to infinity times some you know small imaginary piece, we're going to get an uh, integral that blows up. Right? Okay, and so what we want to do is we want to try to get around this somehow. Okay? And there's a, there's a trick that you can do where you make the zero component of the momentum. So this guy that's in, in this expression, you make that guy uh, slightly uh, complex, right? By, by kind of rotating it uh, by a small amount into the imaginary um, uh, imaginary part of the, uh, the plane, right? So in that case, what you get is, so you want to replace, uh, you want to take um, P0 to go to P0 and one plus I epsilon. It doesn't matter if you take plus or minus here, it works out the same. Anyway, so let me take it like this, or maybe it does, I think it does that sign. So let me take it here. So I, I, I plug in here, right? This is not gonna affect anything. Then I take P naught and I replace it with P naught times one plus I epsilon, okay? In each of those four terms that I had. And what I get uh, is again, I get an oscillating piece, and here I get uh, pieces that are gonna cancel each other off. Right, that's just one. And then I get some oscillating piece that, that goes like epsilon squared, so we can just basically collect that term. Okay, and likewise down here I get these two terms. Uh, this is, remember, this is the troublesome guy right here, but by shifting P naught into, um, you know, into the imaginary part of the plane, um, we're getting uh, this piece right here that's gonna cancel that term off, okay? And so what we get if we neglect these f order you know these epsilon squared pieces is something that looks like basically a sine or cosine. Okay, and that's what we would expect. And that's well behaved as we take the limit of t goes to infinity, so it just oscillates out to infinity. Okay. All right. And it turns out that this trick um, we've seen it before. Right? We've actually used it uh, when we were computing. The Feynman, um, the Feynman propagator, right, because we had these poles at plus or minus, I think, N, I, N, or something, or M, and we were trying to use the contour integration to get uh, to be able to evaluate this thing. So we, we rotated the P naught, or the energy integral part, into um, into a small, you know, that has a small component on the imaginary axis. Okay? So it's a trick we've used. And you know we've accepted it, and it works great. Okay, so it looks like we're in good shape, right? So we can take our t goes to infinity limit, which allows us to work with the vacuum states, right? And it looks like um, when we do so, and we and we take p naught to also have a small imaginary piece, that our integral is well behaved, right? To see the, um, the time interval. But, there's a but, uh, but here, okay? Let's consider a diagram that looks like this, which I would call the peapod. Uh, the peapod diagram, okay? So this is a three loop diagram, okay? This is nothing that you would ever want to calculate in real life, except on, on the final exam. Um, and uh, so what you have is this, this it's it's a it's what we would call a disconnected diagram, meaning that it's not connected to any external points. You don't see any external points there. Okay. All right. So let's let's look at this diagram and try to think of the structure of it. Okay. So let's first consider this vertex here, right? The vertex at z, right? And if I assign momentum like I have it here, so I've got p1 and p2 going to the right. And then here P3 is just a, forms a closed loop. Okay? So if I break that open and, and write down a you know a four-point vertex and use that same substitution that we did you know earlier, I would get something like this. So I get an integral over the z point, um, and and then I get uh, exponentials for P1 and P2, right? They're plus because they're outgoing in this vertex. And then I get a P3 piece that cancels each other off because there's one incoming and one outgoing. Okay. And so what you get when you do this integral is a delta function, right? This is the re integral representation of the delta function. And we said that these are the delta functions that help you, 
you know, when you're going to calculate a full diagram because they'll allow you to get rid of some of those integrations that um, they have to, you know, that are part of the part of the calculation. Right? So this would imply that P1 equals minus P2, right? But what about this vertex? Right? Now we would go over here and look at this vertex. This vertex has basically the same structure. Oops. This one. Uh, this has the same structure, right? We have uh, P1 and P2, but now they're coming in, right? And P4 forms a closed loop. But there we would get another delta function that would look like this, right? And, but if we're you know, using this uh, vertex here, we've already set P1 to P2, or minus P2, right? And so actually this vertex is gonna give us a delta function uh, with an argument of zero, right? And those guys blow up. Those are infinity, okay? So then you gotta say, okay, what the hell's going on here? Um, or how can we fix it? And it turns out that you can see uh, what the problem is a little uh, better if you could work in position space for, for the moment. And there, the integral is just a constant being, uh, being integrated over all of space time. Right? So remember, it's just the coupling, right? We just have the coupling and the, the, the integral. Right? And if we're just considering that vertex, when we do the integral over all space time, the spatial piece is going to give us volume of all, of all of space, right? Three dimensional space. And the time interval is going to give us a factor of 2t, right? It's t minus negative t, okay? <coughs> and what this is telling us is that this process, this, you know, this disconnected, you know, p pi diagram, uh, uh, can happen at any point in space, uh, uh, at any point in space time. So at any point in space, in between our times minus t and t. Okay. And so what, we, what you get when you sum up all of those uh, those possibilities are these infinities. Okay. And it turns out that these types of diagrams, right, the ones that aren't connected to external points which we call disconnected diagrams, each of these guys are going to have this problem, right? They're all going to introduce these infinite terms, either in terms of a delta function with a zero argument, or if you work in position space, you know, some factor of 2 times t times v, and that is also infinite, okay? <clears throat> all right, so it looks like we've got a problem, okay? Because we've seen, uh, I don't have an example here yet, but we've seen that, you know, even in the simplest non, you know, uh, non-free uh, theory part, that you're going to have these loops, right? You're going to have these kind of disconnected loops. Okay? And so you got to have to start to worry about, um, you know, if these things give us infinities, uh, what's happening to our full, you know, correlation amplitude? Right? In other words, do these things actually contribute to the correlation function? If for somehow, some magical reason, you know, they, they don't contribute or somehow they get canceled out, uh, then we would be safe, right? We could still continue on with our, you know, our, the way we've been constructing this, in these calculations. Okay? So we want to see if these diagrams actually contribute. Okay? So what I'm going to do is just consider some typical diagram. Okay? and see where it leads us, okay? So here's my typical diagram. <laughs> okay, the whole, that, that whole thing in huh. big parentheses is one diagram, okay? So here's okay. where, here's where, here's where um, the, uh, the vocabulary gets a little blurry, okay? Because, Stalking with the word typical. <laughs> so, so this whole thing in the parentheses, we would consider it to be one diagram, right? It rep represents one term in that expansion, right? However, this one diagram is made up of uh, one, two, three, four, five separate, what I would call sub-diagrams. 
But a lot of times, you know, people just sit, just call these individual pieces diagrams. Okay, so it's, it gets a little confusing. You just have to remember um, that I try to put parentheses around this thing directly to let you know that this is one one term, one diagram. Okay, and we can see that this diagram. So this is a this is a, a correction to the two point function. Okay, so this is a correction to the two point function. This is between say uh, x and y. Okay, and so we can see that it's made up of one piece that's connected, right? And, and this uh, looks hellish in itself. It's a one, two, three, five loop correction, okay? Um, and then we've got these several disconnected pieces. So we've got the uh, figure eights, the beach ball diagram, and I don't know. Flip side, upside down table. Flip table. Uh, flip table. Yeah. Table flip. Okay. I was thinking more like Longhorn diagram. I don't know. Anyways, so so we've got these disconnected pieces plus this connected piece. Okay, and what we're worried about are these guys. Okay, so let's focus in on these guys and see uh, what we can do. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to label uh, these various diagrams by V sub i. Okay, so V sub i is made. You know, it's going to represent uh, you know, these diagrams, the beach ball diagram, um, the beach ball diagram with the pimple, and so on and so on, okay? So each of, you know, there's going to be a V1 that corresponds to this, a V2 that corresponds to that, and so on and so forth, okay? And what we already know is that these diagrams are, detect are connected internally, but they're disconnected from any external points, okay? And now let's say that, okay, this diagram, uh, contains uh, n uh, sub diagrams that are identical. Okay, so for this particular case, we would say that this diagram has two uh, sub diagrams that are identical. Okay, but you can imagine as you go higher and higher in perturbation theory, you're going to have diagrams that have a crap load of identical disconnected diagrams. Okay, so what we want to do is uh, let's say, okay, so each diagram has, uh, we'll count the number of pieces, the number of sub disconnected sub-diagrams that are identical uh, for each VI, okay, and, and, and the amplitude will be made up of those pieces plus the connected sub-diagram. And we're also, so, so here I'm, I'm letting VI denote a diagram, but we'll also use VI to denote the value that we would compute from that diagram using our Feynman rules. Okay. okay, so what we're saying is that this whole thing, so this, you know, to diagrams with this form, we can write as this, okay? So it's gonna be, you know, when you think about it, when you write down the amplitude, this stuff's gonna be multiplied by this stuff, right? Is that better? Why is it so... So, so what I was saying is that, you know, when I compute the amplitude for this whole diagram, it's going to be the product of this times that times that times that, times that. Okay? okay? So the way we would write that is, so the value of the connected diagram, so this is obviously schematically, okay? So this is the value of the connected diagram times all those pieces, right? But these things, these pieces, these identical pieces, have, you know, there's this, symmetry involved, right? A symmetry of the full diagram, right? So I could switch these two guys and the amplitude that I would write down uh, would be the same, okay? So we have to include a combinatorial factor, which is this one over ni factorial. Okay, it's a symmetry factor, again, from the interchanges of, you know, however many copies of one particular sub-diagram you have. <coughs> And so what we've seen so far is that, you know, in this uh, expression for the uh, uh, correlation function, or the, well, in particular, the two-point correlation function, um, in the interacting theory is made up of two pieces, right? We wrote, have one piece in the numerator, right, where we're actually doing uh, the perturbation theory, and we have the tree-level piece. Right? And then there's a denominator piece that, we, that I told you was going to be almost like a normalizing factor. Okay? 
So we've seen that uh, the, the numerator piece of that, of that monster is just the sum of all diagrams, right? We can represent it in terms of finding diagrams and, and, you know, and write those down, okay? So in, our, so in our case, what we're saying is that the numerator is going to be this, okay? So I had to put stars here because I, there was no way I could write this underneath the sums, okay? So it's sum, two sums now, okay? So the first sum is all possible connected pieces, okay? So you think about, you know, when you're putting together your perturbation theory, uh, you're going to have connected pieces at each order, you're going to have disconnected pieces at each order, okay? So we're going to separate out the value of the connected piece, right, and then sum over all connected pieces. And then I'm going to have these disconnected pieces, right, which I'm just carrying over from here. But I have to sum over the set, the full set of n i's, okay? So each, you know, uh, however many times these things uh, occur, okay? All right, so what we can do is we can actually factor out the connected pieces. Okay? So I can pull... Anything that has to do with connected pieces, I can pull it out, okay? And so I can rewrite it like this, right? So I've just pulled out the connected piece, and here I still have the sum of the set of Ni, okay, of these guys. Okay, so what does this guy look like? Well, if, um, because this will be... Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. It looks like I have. Um, because. Uh, oh, okay. So, so I'm summing it over this set, right? So this, I would have a, a term that goes like M1, and that would be this guy. Maybe it would be sigma instead of pi. Mm -hmm. Looks like product instead of sum. Yeah. Yeah, I think that. I think it should be the sum. This these should be sums, right? Yeah, that seems right. Yeah. Because. Uh, okay, so these are sums. Sorry about that. I was writing this about 12 pi last night. Okay, that makes sense, right? Because I'm taking yeah. Okay, so I'm taking um, I'm taking the pro these products, right, and writing them out, and I still have this sum over the various ni's. And so I can rewrite this as the product over i of the sum over the ni's. So this term. Okay. And this guy, inside the parentheses, should be familiar to everybody, it's just an exponential, right? It's just an exponential, right? So we've reduced this thing, our, our sum over all diagrams, both connected and disconnected, we've reduced it down to something that looks like this. So we've pulled out the connected parts, and the disconnected parts, it looks like, have now become an exponential. So we've exponentiated uh, the disconnected diagrams, and okay? that's what this is technically called in the business. Okay? What it's telling us is that the sum of all diagrams is equal to the sum of all connected diagrams, right? so these guys, times the exponential of all disconnected diagrams. Okay? So we see that we're treating uh, you know, the, 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 these diagrams the way we have, in other words, pulling out the connected from the disconnected, and then accounting for the fact that, you know, in a general diagram, you're going to have n identical pieces of these side or sub diagrams. And then summing over all possible diagrams, we end up with, a, with this relation that tells us that the sum over all diagrams can be broken into a connected piece times the actual initiation of the disconnected piece. So pictorially, it would look like this. So this is our, what our numerator looked like. So this is uh, the exact, uh, so I have the, the x, y, these are the external fields, and this is the guy that we tailor expand. Okay? 
And so what I would have is uh, that thing is telling me I have the sum over connected pieces, right? Which for the two-point function would look like the tree level, one loop, two loop, three loop, so on and so on, times the exponential of the disconnected diagrams. Okay? And this would this would include all disconnected diagrams. Okay, so it would be a sum uh, over all sub um, uh, disconnected sub diagrams. And um, each one would be unique, okay? So there's no duplications here, right? Because we've already incorporated that symmetry factor into uh, the exponential. Okay? So we're making progress, okay? So this thing, this beast, we can now pictorially write it like this. That's just the numerator, right? But what about the denominator? So the denominator looks like this. Right? Notice it doesn't have uh, the external fields that the numerator did. Right? So if you go back and you do the same type of calculation that we just did, you'll find that the only thing that this guy gives you is the exponential part. Right? Gives you the exponential of the disconnected diagrams. Okay? And so if you put the numerator and then you divide it by that denominator, what's going to happen? These exponentials cancel out. Right? Everybody agree with that? Okay. Michael thinks, Michael looks like he's thinking about it. Well, it's sandwiched in between the, the ground state. No, 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 no. no. The, the, this, is the, this is the full numerator. Yeah. And this is the non-denominator. Right, so they're not... They're not, yeah. As a, you know, yeah, big term sandwich. But if you have like the integral of the product and the integral of the term in the denominator, because you know the those when the numerator and denominator each are sandwiched, it's like taking an integral, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so. But this would represent the integrated result. Mm -hmm. oh. The end result. Okay. Then, okay. Right? So, the, yeah, so, there, so you're fine. That's what I was saying that, yeah, it's not, I know, yeah, I know what you're saying, but, um, but here it's like, the, it's like the after you've integrated. Okay. No, okay. no worries. Okay. So I think everybody agrees that now the exponential pieces cancel out. Okay. And so what we find is that, Magically, the final form of the two-point correlation function, this guy, this, now this is what we started with, if you remember, because these were the ground states in the interacting theory, and this is time order product of the interacting fields, right? We went through all that rigmarole to get it written down in terms of uh, non-interacting or, you know, this interaction picture fields, right? So the non-interacting vacuum interaction picture fields, which was this thing divided by that thing. And that's what led us to start looking at diagrammatic techniques. Right? But now we see that this thing is just the sum of all connected diagrams, right, with two points. So it's a two-point function, so it has two external points. Right? So all that's left over uh, diagrammatically is just the sum over all connected diagrams. So this problem that we had as far as um, uh, you know, as far as this diagram, right, these, this, this disconnected diagram uh, giving us a delta function with the zero argument, which would blow up, it doesn't matter in the end because those, ex those disconnected pieces get exponentiated and then they get canceled by the denominator of our expression. Okay. All right, and all this can be, you know, we always in this class we always consider the simplest case, which is the two-point function. But you can generalize this whole approach to any n-point function you want. Right. So one that we'll be interested in is the four-point function. Right. So there you would have, you know, I think we've already seen that we had, you know, some connected diagrams, and then they would be multiplied by some disconnected pieces. Right. But here. What, what this thing is telling us is that 
This is the sum over all connected diagrams. Okay, so every uh, uh, every line touches an external point. Okay, all right, so that includes these diagrams where the fields aren't interacting, right, which are going to be boring to us. Uh, and then the pieces where the fields are interacting, so like these guys and then this guy. Okay. Okay. All right, so we know now how to compute correlation functions. And what we want to start to do is figure out how to turn these into um, something that we can measure. All right, so the, the, these two point functions. Kind of have a fuzzy idea of what they are. They're like propagators. Yeah. Um, the, on the previous page, the diagrams that are just you know two lines, they're still considered fully connected. Mm -hmm. Because it's shared with a key. Yeah, it is. A, well, so they're they're connected. They're, I wouldn't say they're fully. Did I say that they're fully connected? I don't know. Okay. So they're connected in the sense that, like I said, that mm -hmm. um, they're connected. Yeah. There's, no, there's just no disconnected diagrams. Right, and there's everything terminates at a source. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we're we're, we're mm -hmm. referring to. Okay, so so we kind of have a fuzzy idea of what these correlation functions are. They're basically transition amplitudes. Right, and if you remember from uh, quantum mechanics, you know how to get from a scattering amplitude to a cross section. You just take a modulus square. Right? Um, but here it's a little more complicated. So we're going to try to start to work towards cross sections and something called the S matrix. Okay. Uh, so first, let me just paint kind of a broad picture of what a cross section is. Okay, just for people that might not know. So a cross section, uh, we can define it like this. Okay, so this is a uh, what I would call like a fixed target setup, but you can generalize it to the case where you have colliding beams. Okay, so what we're going to have is uh, we can consider a target at rest, and it's made up of a bunch of particles, right? And these particles have a number density that we'll call rho a, and typically what happens is in these Colliding experiments is they bunch these guys together. Okay, so so we'll have two bunches. One uh, in this case, which is the target. Right, and these bunches have you know a, you know a microscopic length. Right, so so the length here is going to be L A. There's number density rho A, and then at that target we're going to shoot another bunch of particles. Right, and these particles we'll call particle B, and they also have a number density at some length. Okay, but these guys are coming in with some velocity b. Okay. But like I said, you can just as easily consider the case where they're both um, moving towards each other. Okay. And so what we would what we would expect naively is that the number of scattering events is going to be proportional to what? Can be proportional to obviously the, the densities, right? And L, right? So how long those two bunches are, you know, crossing each other? Right? So that's that would we, naively we would expect that the number of scattering events we get would depend on the bunch length, right, along with the number of density of particles in that bunch, right? And then also one thing that we didn't point out here. Is that these guys have you know a cross-sectional area, right? So you could you could think of you know maybe um, maybe a you know is a lot wider. Maybe it's you know really like a big target, right? And so if we have a beam of particles, uh, you know the number of scattering events we have is going to, of course, you know it's also going to depend on the cross-sectional area of this beam. Okay? So it's going to depend on a few quantities. So the length of the beam number density, and the cross-sectional area, which I'll call big A. Okay. Now the cross-section uh, in you know, quantum mechanical terms is just the total number of events, uh, and not just any events, 
Okay, so it's it's we're looking at specific processes, right? So we're colliding particles A and B, and say we're looking for you know um, the probability that we get particle C out, right? We get any number of particles C coming out. Okay, so that would be a particular final state that we would be interested in. Okay, so the way you get the cross section is you take the total number of events of the desired type. So this would be the number of the events that have particle C in them, and divide by all of these quantities. Okay, so I would have uh, my cross section, which I denote by sigma, is the number of scattering events divided by all these quantities. Okay. And if you do, if you check the you know the units, you see that this thing, sure enough, has units of area. Okay, it's a small area, but it's area. Okay. All right, and uh, you can uh, pull out the number of events by multiplying top and bottom by uh, the area here. And what you find is that the number of events is just given by the cross section times the number of A and B particles that you have divided by this cross section, um, this cross sectional area. Okay. And so you say, well, you know, why do high energy experimentalists always talk about? Uh, cross sections, right? You know, what's the what's the important thing about that? Well, the nice thing is that cross sections uh, don't, you know, uh, don't have a, a dependence on the specifics of the experiment. Right? We're going to see that cross sections really only depend on particle masses, uh, that particle interactions, and things like that. Things that are intrinsic to the particles themselves. Okay, so that's what makes that's what makes um, the cross section a nice uh, quantity to talk about because you can compare uh, cross sections you know that are done at you know the LHC and then from cross sections that were done at the Tevatron right and there you have uh, two different beam energies and one you have you're clotting protons one you're clotting protons and antiprotons right um, so you, you can compare uh, quantities you know between two you know, very different experiments. Okay. And a lot of times we're not just going to be interested. So this is just going to be a number, right? Um, it might be a number that, say, if we were looking at particle C and we didn't know what, uh, say, we didn't know what the, part, the mass of particle C was, right? So this would be, uh, it's going to be a number, but it's going to be a function of the mass of particle C, right? So that's, uh, what we did back in the old days before the Higgs boson was discovered is if you computed a cross section for the Higgs, the Higgs mass was a free parameter, right? So you'd always see these plots of the cross section as a function of the Higgs mass. Okay? Uh, but if you know the masses of everything, you know the couplings of everything, then this thing's just a number. Right? It's just a single number. Right? So a lot of times what we're interested in is not the total cross section, but what we call the differential cross section. Okay. So this is where um, we uh, are interested in the final state momentum of the scattered particles. So the particles that are coming out, we look at their, their momentum, right? Not just uh, magnitude, but direction, right? And the way that those particles come out tells us something about, you know, the interactions. Okay. Um, so that, that's cross section, and then, like I said, the broad picture. We're going to get into the nitty gritty uh, next time. Okay, but another thing that uh, might come up every once in a while, and I don't think we talked about it much in the summer, is the decay rates. Right. And so we have um, almost, you know, well, most particles in the standard model are unstable. Right. The sun is the photon and the gluon, but uh, uh, so these things decay, right? So what we like to do is define um, something called the decay rate. Uh, anytime we have unstable particles, right? the decay rate is just the number of decays per unit time divided by the number of whatever particles we're considering that are present in this material. So that's how you would define it in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Right? Um, so you might see something like this, right? So if you're plotting uh, the cross section as a function of the energy, right? Energy of particles coming out, or maybe the energy of the colliding beams, 
right? You would see, uh, you know, this this cross section dropping off as you go up in energy, right, or up in mass or whatever. But uh, sometimes you'll hit these what they call resonances, right? So this is where you're producing that unstable particle, and then that unstable particle uh, decays. Okay. And we'll talk more about those uh, a lot. Okay. Or you'll see discussions about resonances a lot. Okay. And it turns out that you can uh, represent a resonance with what's called the bright Wigner formula. Okay, so you can write down, this is again in, in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, but so, so near the resonance energy, uh, you can describe the shape of this bump by using this bright Wigner formula, which says that the scattering amplitude goes like this, right, where this gamma is the decay rate. Okay. And so when you cross, uh, when you compute the cross section, which is just this thing modulus squared, uh, it would look something like this. So as you approach E, uh, or as, as you approach E naught, you know, as you're scanning through E, if this guy was in here, you'd hit some point where the cross section would blow up, right? And that's what this resonance is, right? But the fact that it doesn't blow up, that it turns over, is due to the fact that you have this, um, this uh, decay rate dependence there. Okay? And the width of the resonance is equal to the decay rate, of the unstable particle. Okay. Uh, so that's all in non-relativistic physics. Maybe you've seen it before. Uh, we, can, we can do the same thing in relativistic quantum mechanics or, or in quantum field theory. And we just basically do a straightforward uh, generalization. Okay, So we have to remember, we have to uh, impose Lorentz invariance when we're talking about QFT. So that's why things are coming in as scalars, right? P squared, M squared. So on and so on, All right? But you can still write down a bright Wigner form, okay, for the scattering amplitude. It just goes like this p squared now. Okay, and if you, you can expand it out, uh, it looks something like this. Okay. All right. All right. So I want to just touch on. Um, Kind of have a general idea now of what a cross section is, but how do we actually go about calculating it in quantum field theory? Okay. And we're just going to, like I said, I'm just going to sketch it out uh, right now, and then on Monday we'll do the heavy lifting. Okay. So how do we calculate a cross section? All right. So in quantum field theory, uh, we want to calculate these cross sections uh, basically like you do in in regular quantum mechanics, right? If you remember from scattering. So first what we'll do is we'll set up wave packets that represent the initial state particles. Right? And if you remember from your scattering theory days, those particles are assumed to be very far apart. Right? These are the particles that are going to collide. Okay? So they're very far apart in both space and time. Right? So that means that we can set them up as nice clean wave packets. We don't have to worry about them overlapping or anything. All right, so we take those wave packets and then we propagate them in time using the time evolution operator. Right? Okay. And we'll, again, we're working in the interacting theory, so remember the HI, so let's just put HI here. So the Hamiltonian has some time dependence. Right? Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of a cross between the Schrodinger and um, Heisenberg. So we take those wave packets, those initial wave packets, and we propagate them for a very long time using the, the time evolution operator. And then what we want to do is we want to compute the amplitude that those two particles, initial state particles, came in and interacted and end up in some particular final state. All right, so what we, take, what we do is we take uh, our, our propagated wave packets and compute the overlap, you know, the, the, the overlap between that and the state that we want. That gives us the scattering amplitude, okay? Or the probability amplitude, okay? And then from there, it's just math, right? You just have to take that thing and take modulus squared and, you know, integrate and some other stuff. Minor details. I'm saying that with uh, tongue in cheek. It's, <laughs> um, okay? 
So that, that's kind of the, the, the game plan, right? That overall game plan is that to find these two-way packets, um, they're well-defined, they're very far apart in the space and time, you propagate them so they're close, and then you compute the, the overlap between that and the state that you want, okay? So how do we do this? Well, so we represent a wave packet in quantum field theory like this, okay? So we have our one particle state in, there. in the interacting theory, we have some uh, Fourier transform of the spatial wave function, right? And then we have to uh, make sure that this thing's Lorentz invariant, so we've got this factor of one over uh, square root of 2e. And in the non-interacting theory, right? yeah. in the non-interacting theory, we know how to construct these one particle states, right? They're just basically an eight dagger hitting the vacuum, and then again, four. Uh, for instance, various reasons, we have to put, them, put in this factor square root 2 e And so that square root, that 1 over square root, uh, in the definition of our wave packet, this guy, uh, ensures that all probabilities sum to 1. In other words, if I, when I take uh, you know, the dot product between the wave packet and itself, I should get 1, and that's if the wave function is normalized correctly. Remember the wave, this, I'm writing it in general, but remember this is like the E to the IKX piece, right? The propagating wave part. Okay? So as long as we, you know, ensure that, you know, enforce this, we should be okay in, in assuming that these guys are normalized. Okay? So what we want to do is we want to compute the probability that we start in the very far past, right? So this is, but this is, these are important. Details. So we're starting in the very far past uh, with some particular uh, initial state. In this case, we're starting with uh, phi A and phi B. So we're colliding A and B particles. Okay. The reason that we say it's in the far past is because when you compare you know, the time that it takes the particles to get to the interaction point compared to the time that they're actually interacting, it's, it's like being in the very far past. right? So that, that's what allows us to take these limits of t goes to plus or minus infinity because the interaction time is actually is so short that um, it doesn't you know it doesn't matter. Okay, so we're we're computing the probability that phi a phi b or a and b particles um, interact and produce some you know particular final state made up of phi one phi two you know however many particles we want in the final state. And this is in the far future, right? So this is in the t goes to infinity limit. Okay. And um, sometimes you'll hear these calls. So this would be the n state, i n, particles coming in, and these are the particles coming out. Right? Or, or sometimes this will be called the initial state, the final state. Okay. All right. And just end on the note, like I already said, that these wave, you know, these are going to be the wave packets that we're going to construct. These things are localized in space, and so what we can do is we can construct those independently, right? When we go to write down our Gaussian wave packets, uh, we can do so like they're completely isolated from anything else uh, in the universe, okay? Okay, so that's where I was going to stop um, today, and then like I said, when we pick it up next time, we'll start with the heavy lifting. We'll start to plug in the wave packets here and compute these things. Okay. All right. Any questions? Sorry. No. No. Okay. All right. Cool. I'll see you guys Monday. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Bye. Bye. So, uh, any suggestions about what I should bring? Um, just whatever you want. Okay. Um, we're making we're making turkey. Okay. And so we were uh, bring dessert. Sign. All right. Sweet one.